And that does definitely resonate with our hearts today as we stop and we think about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for ministering to our hearts, Mary Louise, this morning. If you take your Bibles, please turn with me to Mark chapter 2, Mark the second chapter. This morning we encounter two events that will occur uh, very, very much in the same time frame. Both of them deal with the Sabbath. The second of the two deals with the healing of the man who has a withered hand. So this morning, as we contemplate Mark chapter 2, I'd ask you to look with me at Mark chapter 2, verse 23, and allow me to read here for you until the end of the chapter those few verses. Would you stand with me, please, in honor of God's word today? Verse 23, and it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar, the high priest, and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests. And he also gave it to those who were with him. And Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father, we come to this passage of Scripture and the verses following it as well today. We recognize, Lord, that there was an understanding of the day concerning the Sabbath Father, help us to understand the intention of the Sabbath as you gave it to the Jewish people. Help us, Father, to understand the message behind it and understand the, not only the purpose for it, but why it is not being carried out by the church today. Help us, Father, to listen to the words of Jesus and allow them to penetrate into our hearts and minds today, for we can learn so much from this passage of Scripture, I believe. Teach us your word, I ask in Christ's name. Amen. may be seated. Well, this morning we come to a couple of interesting passages of Scripture, and there's much to be noted here because Jesus is, again, directly running contrary to the thought processes of the people during the time that Jesus is, is walking the earth. Jesus is directly challenging their thinking on this whole issue of the Sabbath. The people had been convinced as they lived out their daily lives that the the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the people in the Sanhedrin, the scribes were all correct in how they have defined what Sabbath day worship is all about. And the people are living life in light of what has been handed to them by the Pharisees. And so as you come to this passage and Jesus begins to to take the lid off this whole subject of Sabbath day, uh, what you find is you're not only challenging the Pharisees, but you're also challenging the people that are following them. And so it becomes a very complicated matter that Jesus is beginning to address. And as Jesus would challenge this, what we are going to find is that in challenging this, he is really uh, breaking that last straw. I mean, it is for the Pharisees, the end of the discussion. It is over, and they are not interested in anything then that Jesus would have to say after this time period. So it's important to note how significant this really is in what is being talked about. I want you to see here that the Sabbath day, when you stop and you think about it, and he says in verse 23, it happened he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Sabbath day worship is part of the law that was given by Moses. You go back to Exodus chapter 20, and you find out that it is uh, one-tenth of the Ten Commandments, right? I mean, it's part of uh, all of those things. You also note that it's the only one of those Ten Commands that's non-moral. Uh, It's basically ceremonial. And you also note that it was relative to the Old Covenant, and it's not repeated in the New Testament, and it is not part of the New Covenant that is in Christ. 
The other nine commands, however, are repeated in the New Testament because they pertain to moral and spiritual absolutes. And so they are thereby in force. Having said that, when Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he is ministering during the time period of the Old Covenant. And the Old Covenant is in full effect. So all the requirements of the Old Covenant, including the Sabbath, were required to be observed by the Jewish people, and they were required for Jesus himself to obey. So we're not saying that Jesus had the opportunity to just throw this aside. He would come and he would fulfill all of the scripture. He would refill, fulfill all of those things. The problem and the point of contention that we see here in this passage is related to the fact that for hundreds of years, the rabbis were passing down interpretations and regulations that pertained to the Sabbath. And so the Sabbath, as it was given by God, began to take on a very different look and feel as these regulations are passed down. And so it becomes more and more and more complicated. Uh, as the time goes on, it becomes much more of a burden uh, trying to observe uh, this one command out of 10. Now, as they laid all of this on the people, they laid such a burden on the people that the people realized, you know, there's really no way we can keep even the 10th of the 10 commandments. Uh, this is a burden that is so enormous that we fear we're breaking it by just waking up on Saturday morning. And so the difficulty is there. Now the point I want you to take away, and, and, and it's really a, uh, something that has really stuck with me, has been the reality that when the Jewish rabbis, the Pharisees, put all of these weights on the people, they change something that was enormously significant. And you don't want to miss this. I mean, I think this is, could be the main point of, of this entire uh, passage and certainly the main point of this, this message. But the people had a view of God just like you have a view of God this morning. And by placing all of these burdens and all of this heavy weight upon the people with regard to keeping the Sabbath, the Pharisees had changed the image of God in the minds of the people. You follow me? How they viewed God was skewed, it was perverted, it was changed because all of these regulations had been handed down. It is exactly the opposite of how God wanted to be portrayed in front of the people. It is not consistent with the nature of Almighty God. In fact, if you stop and think with me about this for a moment, think about all the other religions of the world. Think about all the other religions. All the other religions bring these enormous demands down upon the people, don't they? Oh, you've got to follow the eightfold path. Uh, you've got to pray five times a day. Uh, you've got to keep all of these regulations. You've got to uh, make, uh, you know, confessions, and you have to, to pay penance, or uh, you have to be confirmed. You have to do this. You have to do that. Uh, you, you get in, into Buddhism, and you see, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the aspects there, and there's just a huge, heavy weight upon people. It's one of the things I hate the most about religion. Can I just say that? God is not desiring to place a burden on you that you cannot hold to. He is not of that persuasion. That is not the character of Almighty God. He is a God of mercy, and he is a God of justice, but he is not a God who is trying to place requirements on you that you cannot possibly maintain. And you will, if you're following a false religion, you will try to maintain all of those things with absolutely no guarantee, no peace, no assurance that when you finally die, you've done the right thing. So Jesus comes along, he's going to challenge the thinking because the Pharisees had actually changed the image of God in the hearts of the people. And it was a huge, huge problem. First point I want you to consider, and obviously this morning as we stop and we think of the, even the title of the, the, the message, so what really matters more? Uh, and we're going to get to the answer of that uh, when we get to the end. But I want you to think of the purpose of the Sabbath. 
Jesus went on and he said to them, he said, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The purpose of the Sabbath was that it was supposed to be something that was positive. How do you view the commands of God? Let me just ask you that question this morning. How do you view the commands of God? Oh, Kevin. Oh, the commands of God. They are so burdensome. They are just to the point where, listen, if that's where you are, you probably don't know the Christ of the Bible. I'll just tell you the way it is. God is doing this for the benefit of the people. In other words, the whole aspect of the Sabbath and the importance of the Sabbath was supposed to be a blessing. You say, what? I thought the Ten Commandments were just some like heavy weight that God just like, okay, you guys, I'm sick and tired of you. I'm gonna give you 10 things that are gonna just mess up your life and create a nightmare for you to live out every week. That's not it. When those tablets were delivered to the people of Israel, they were intended to be a blessing for the people of Israel. And the whole idea that God creates the heavens and the earth in seven days, actually he created them in how many days? Six days, because on the seventh day, he what? Now why did God do seven days? Why didn't he just do six days and tell us to just rest the rest of our lives? That would have been cool, right? <laughs> but he doesn't do that. God says, here's six days, and on the seventh day, and so we have a theological principle that's going to carry on for all eternity, six days work, one day rest. The one day rest was enormously significant. It was a huge, huge blessing to the people. Because on that one day, first of all, they got a day off. They got a day off. And you know what was really cool? Everybody had the same day off. Everybody had the same day off. So you got together with your families, your kids weren't running out to work at McDonald's or, you know, and you're, you, this is going on and that's going on. Uh, you know, there were no sports on Sunday. You actually rested and you actually spent time with people. Now that is a novel concept, isn't it? Do you think our country would be better off if we just would observe that one little principle? But you see, instead we make it out to be a burden. Oh, it's such a burden. Oh, I can't believe this. Uh, I'm so old, I grew up at a time when uh, there were all these laws and you couldn't do much on Sundays. Stores weren't even open on Sundays. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine Sundays? Are, listen, it's the craziest thing. It's the craziest thing. We moved to Pennsylvania on Wednesday nights. Everything was shut down. They didn't even have many sports a lot of times on Wednesday. I said, what for? All oh, the farmers, they came together for prayer meeting at a church. What? What? Seriously. So when God principalizes all these things and he hands them to the people of Israel, they're not to be construed as being onerous. They're continued blessings from God because God is desiring to bless the people. Are you with me? Hallelujah. The points to ponder, you don't have it on there, but what you need to write down is the first point to ponder is that God is good. God is good. And what Jesus is doing is good. And so what man is doing has corrupted and changed the image of Almighty God and has caused the image of God to look like the false gods of the world that are placing enormous burdens on people, asking them to do things that they can't possibly do. I am so glad that I am not a religious person. Can I just say that? I am anti-religious. I, I, I cringe when I see somebody in a robe, and I don't care if it's uh, saffron or whatever it is. I cringe. I, it is just not me. I am so thankful that Jesus saved me, and he saved me by the grace of God, simply by his word. I am fired up about that. I am so glad that I didn't have to go to catechism classes like all my neighbors and cousins and relatives. I am so glad that God never made me do those things. I am so glad for the simplicity of Jesus' teaching. Can I just say that? I'm a little fired up about that. The purpose of the Sabbath was to be a blessing. But there was a perversion of the Sabbath that took place. As I mentioned, the Pharisees added significantly to the basic teaching. They added so much that it ceased to be a blessing. 
And it was actually dangerous to try to follow the Sabbath regulations that they had set forward. In fact, if you go back through history, you will see that uh, in the apocryphal book of Maccabees, it tells of an incident during the time of Judas Maccabeus when a group of Jews refused to defend themselves on the Sabbath against a Greek army led by Antiochus Epiphanes. As the soldiers of Antiochus attacked the Jews, the Jews didn't even answer them. Uh, they didn't even throw a stone at them. They didn't stop. They just, they said, let us die in our innocency. Heaven and earth shall testify for us that you put us to death wrongfully. So Antiochus Epiphanes came against them on the Sabbath because they assumed that they would not fight back and indeed did not fight back and they were all slain on that time, at that time. In the antiquities that uh, Jewish historian Josephus writes in, uh, he reports that it was because the Jews would not defend themselves on the Sabbath that the Roman general Pompey was able to conquer Jerusalem. As was the custom in ancient Roman warfare, Pompey built a high mound from which his troops could bombard the city. And the Jews, they were aware, uh, you know, of the, the whole thing that was going on there. And Pompey knew that he could go in there on the Sabbath and that they would not fight back. And so that is exactly what took place. And Josephus writes, he says, this bank, this high mound that they were able to gain the advantage with could never have been perfected by reason of the opposition of the Jews, but through their law, they would not defend themselves against those that began uh, to fight with us and assault us. And so they said, it is better for us uh, to observe the Sabbath and be innocent before God on the point of the Sabbath than to actually die. So we're not going to fight. And so they died. When the Talmud is written, it's the interpretation of Jewish tradition, um, you see a lot of limitations. You see a lot of these perversions of the law. For instance, uh, they write 24 chapters just on the Sabbath. 24 chapters. That's a lot of writing, isn't it? I mean, you say, well, it depends on how big the chapters are, I guess. But one law specified that the basic limit for travel was 3,000 feet from a person's house. But various exceptions were provided. If you place some food within 3,000 feet of your house, you could go there and eat it. And because the food was considered an extension of the house, you could then go another 3,000 feet beyond the food. Ah, there's ways around this. So that's what the Talmud is explaining. Well, here's what the law is that we've tried to come up with, but here's how the loopholes work, okay? And so you kind of became a student of not God's word, but the student of tradition. And it was very, very important. If a rope were placed across an adjoining street or alley, the building on the other side, as well as the alley between, could be considered part of your house. So you could enlarge your house. So you get together with your neighbors, pretty soon you got four city blocks and you go wherever you want to go. You can walk more than 3,000 feet. And who came up with 3,000 feet? And certain objects could be lifted up and put down only from and to certain places. Other things could be lifted up from a public place and set down in a private one and vice versa. Still others could be picked up in a, you get the idea. I mean, this is like bizarro. How in the world are you supposed to keep this? Remember the premise that God is good and his commands are designed to be a not a burden and this is what you're seeing here with the rabbis and what they have done and and all of these things that have been uh, loaded upon their heads and shoulders here's another one throwing an object into the air with one hand and catching it with the other was prohibited <laughs> yeah and if the sabbath overtook you as you reached for some food in other words, just at the moment, you're trying to eat this food just before the Sabbath would start. But all of a sudden, you know, the, 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 the whistles went off, and all of a sudden, if you had reached for some food, the food was to be dropped before drawing your arm back. If not, you were guilty of carrying a burden. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So you could be in big trouble. Now, some of you might like this. Uh, baths could not be taken for fear some of the water might spill onto the floor and wash it. And you'd be guilty of working. You'd be guilty of washing the floor. Chairs couldn't be moved because dragging them might make a furrow in the ground. You'd be guilty of plowing. I can't make this stuff up. 
A woman was not to look in a mirror on the Sabbath day, lest she find a gray hair and be tempted to pull it out, thus plucking, i.e. harvesting something. <laughs> wow. It's on this backdrop that we come to verse 23. Now that you understand a little bit about, oh my, what in the world is going on, you can understand it that when Jesus is passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, his disciples were picking their way along and they were picking the heads of the grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, a couple things here. They didn't have big roads. These were little pathways that people would travel, and there would be grain fields on both sides very often. So you're literally walking through these pathways, and you're rubbing shoulders with this grain. And you would, if you were, uh, to, to pick this grain, uh, that was something that was lawful to do. If you were a person who was hungry and starving, it was legal to go and do that. And you knew that as a farmer, that it was okay, it was acceptable in your society. I don't know how it would be in our society today if you pulled off and just started eating some farmer's corn. Um, I'm not sure I, I would find that very tantalizing. <laughs> it's a little crunchy, you know what I mean? Um, but if you're a cow, it'd probably be fine. So, so as you're walking through, it was legal to do that. When the Pharisees accused Jesus of doing that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath, what they were literally saying there was that, wait a minute, uh, we know it would be legal to, to just grab a hold of that, but the problem was what you did with it once you had it was, was illegal. It was one of those deals where um, you picked it up and you began to, uh, you know, to, to do things that you weren't supposed to do with it brings us to the next point. The perspectives of the Lord are what is very significant here. I want you to note that as the disciples are walking through those grain fields and they're picking this, it was not forbidden to take the grain if they needed it for food. Here's the rabbinic tradition, and this is why they said to Jesus, you're not doing something that's lawful. If you rub the grain in your hands, which would they, that's what they were doing according to Luke chapter 6, you were guilty of threshing the grain. And if you blew the chaff away, you were guilty of winnowing the grain. So the Talmud defines it in great detail. If a person rolls wheat to remove its husks, if sifting, he rubs the heads of wheat, it's threshing, if he cleans off the side uh, adherences, it's sifting, if he bruises the ears, it's grinding, if he throws it up in his hand, it's winning. He had everything all written out. As I mentioned, the old covenant is in full effect. Jesus is not there to break this covenant. But the point is this. He didn't break the covenant, and what the disciples were doing was absolutely lawful according to the word of God as God had given it. And Jesus is God. Jesus knew exactly what he'd given. What he hadn't given was all of this minutia and all of these extra regulations. And so Jesus is totally righteous in taking this position. He justifies this with a scriptural answer. He says, have you not read what David did? You'll notice that in verse 25. There was deep sarcasm there. These Pharisees, th th their whole life was spent in the word of God. And now you're talking about David. David uh, is, is the epitome of greatness in their minds. Of course they knew. That's ridiculous to think that they didn't know. And Jesus points out that King David was justified in taking that showbread because of the hunger that they had. And when you stop and you think about what is being done, David and Ahimelech are not judged for doing this. God recognized that the ceremonial law that was associated with the Sabbath was not to be that burden. And so the premise goes on. And Jesus has defended himself uh, by this example. There's not a Pharisee there who can say, well, I guess you're right. Uh, and, and not know that they were right, he was right in their hearts. 
Now, by the time you come to chapter three, Jesus enters again into a synagogue. So he's not totally thrown out, which is a good thing. And the Bible says there was a man there whose hand was withered. And they were watching him. The Pharisees are watching Jesus like a hawk to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that he might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And all the Pharisees must have gasped. Uh, they're waiting to see. What is Jesus going to do with this man who has a withered hand? And uh, the verb tense is there in the original would indicate that this man's hand was not withered his entire life. He was more than likely injured at some point in his life. And so he's got this disability. And Jesus calls upon him to come. Now before Jesus heals him, notice verse 4. Jesus said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to save a life or allow the death to take place? Well, that is a great question. And what Jesus is going to do is he's going to really cut them off at the pass, so to speak. I mean, this was, uh, this was pretty significant. You see, we can get so ridiculous. What is the obvious answer here? The obvious answer is what? Save the life. Do what is right. Do the, the right thing. There's a story about Mo and Lenny who are strolling home from shul one Saturday morning or synagogue. And suddenly a, a cab speeds past and their friend Irving is running frantically behind it, flailing his arms wildly. Well, said Lenny, I never imagined our good friend Irving was a Sabbath violator. Look at him run for the taxi. Wait a minute, Mo replied. Didn't you read that book I lent you, the other side of the story, about the command to judge other people favorably? I'll bet we can think of hundreds of excuses for Irving's behavior. Yeah, like what? Well, maybe he's sick and he needs to go to a hospital. Come on, he was running 60 miles an hour after that cab. He's healthier than Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, maybe his wife's having a baby. No, no, she had one last week. Well, maybe he needs to visit her in the hospital. No, she's home. Well, maybe he's running to the hospital to get a doctor. He is a doctor. Well, maybe he needs supplies from the hospital. The hospital's a three-minute walk in the opposite direction. Well, maybe he forgot that it's the Sabbath. Of course he knows it's the Sabbath. Didn't you see his tie? It's the Paisley 100% uh, silk one that he wears every Sabbath. <laughs> wow, he says, you're really observant. I didn't even notice he was wearing a tie, Lenny said. Mo says, how could you not notice? Didn't you see how it was caught on the back fender of the taxi? <laughs> Jesus asked the question, is it better to give life or is it better to kill? Pretty simple question, isn't it? Now, we don't have it here in Mark, but we have it over in Matthew, and I'm not going to take the time this morning uh, to turn there and look at it, uh, but in Matthew, uh, Jesus talks about the illustration of, of uh, the person who would have a sheep that would fall into a pit. And he says, on the Sabbath day, who wouldn't go and pull that sheep out of the pit? Now, you're starting to wade into some economic reasons for rescuing the sheep. Do you catch my drift? But all of the Pharisees there would have done what was considered to be the wise thing in that situation, and they would have violated their regulations by going and pulling that sheep out of the pit. It would not have violated the regulations that God had set forward, but it would all of their additional regulations. So keep in the back of your mind the reality for these Pharisees as they watch Jesus call for this man to come to him with this withered hand. Just keeping in mind how they handled the medical aspect is bizarre. Do you know that if a person became ill on the Sabbath day, there was, it, it was regulated that only enough treatment could be given to triage that person and keep them from dying? Treatment to make him improve was declared to be work and therefore a burden. 
to determine how much food, medicine, or bandaging would be necessary to keep a person alive and no more was in itself an impossible burden. And so they had already classified this act of healing potentially to be work-related. And it's there on the Sabbath. Jesus makes the point and he says, what is lawful to do? To do harm or to save a life? And they couldn't answer him in verse 4. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. These leaders would not even answer Jesus in the context of all of these other people sitting there and realizing what was going to happen. They had no answer. And Jesus is looking at them, and after looking around at them with anger and grieved at the hardness of their heart, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. Jesus is using the Sabbath because he's the master of it. He's using it for good, as God had intended. And the Bible says that these Pharisees were so angry at that point that they went out and they only wanted one thing, and that was to put to death Jesus. Barnhouse quotes, he says, it's at this point in history that Israel's clock stopped. You see, there was no more consideration at this point among the religious leaders with regard to Jesus. And as Jesus would do this great miracle and show them the significance of the character of God, you see, it all carries out. If God is a God who is rich in mercy, if God is a God who is a loving God, and truly this is our God, is it not? He is a God of great compassion and great love, and what he wants is the best for humanity. And if he wants the best by placing requirements, then he is going to follow through. And that is exactly what you see in the person of Jesus Christ as Jesus comes to die in our place. And so let me ask you the question. As Matthew chapter 12 says, quoting Jesus, but if you had known what this means... I desire compassion and not sacrifice. You would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. What really matters more? You see, what really mattered was the heart of the people. The heart of the people. That's really what the difference maker was. You see, what God is desiring is for us to have a heart that is full of passion for him. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart and soul and mind. And God has made it easy for us to love him, has he not? Look at all he has done for us. Look at the blessings that he's poured out upon sinful human beings like you and me. God has done all these things because indeed he does love me. 1 John chapter 5 is going to tell us that the love of God is something that is very, very real. I wasn't going to read it, but I, let me just take a moment and, and read a couple of these verses so that you get the impression with regard to the Lord. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. They're not burdensome. God has given to his people Israel the Ten Commandments. When you come to the New Testament, the New Testament is full of all types of things that, that tells us how to live a godly life, how to live a happy life, how to live a prosperous life. They're all right there in the scriptures. And why does God give to us his word? He wants to bless you with his word. Do you realize that by following those Ten Commandments, 
If you were an Israelite and you followed those Ten Commandments, you would be blessed, you would be satisfied, you would have so much to praise God for because it would eliminate from your life the heartache of sinfulness in carrying out those things which were evil. Do you realize that God is giving to us, even the commands in Scripture in the New Testament, things that will make your life better? Do you believe that? The way of the transgressor, the Bible says, is hard. And so many Christians learn the hard way by following their own patterns of life and being sinful. God is looking for a heart that is full of passion for him. That's what he desires. He didn't desire from the Pharisees all these rules and regulations. He he wasn't trying to place a burden that they tried to keep. He was concerned about their heart. That's what he really was interested in. God rejects those who obey the rules, thinking that the rules alone will please him. And that kind of ties back into that first point to consider, doesn't it? He wants us to be passionate about him. I I could lay out all the types of things that we ought to be doing. You know, some people think to themselves, well, I'll be pleasing God. You know, I got to read my Bible every day. And so you take a couple minutes, you read a verse, check the box. Say a quick prayer at a meal, check the box. Doing those things that are external for the purpose of trying to just check the box is not what God is interested in. God is interested in your heart, and he wants your heart to be full of passion for him. Now, let me just point this out. Because a lot of places, we condemn legalism. And we say, oh, that's legalism. Now, there's two different kinds of legalism. There's one kind of legalism where people try to do things in order to get to heaven. And religions around the world are full of legalism, right? I mean, it's just, I got to do this, I got to do this. Maybe I get a chance to go to heaven at the end of it all. The other type of legalism says, well, if I do those things and check those boxes, I will be spiritually what God wants me to be. And that is not the case. The problem in our time has been that in opposition to legalism, which is fine, is we've oftentimes failed to see the difference between biblical standards for Christian living and legalism. And we have tossed out the biblical standards that God's word has said we should abide by. And it all goes back to the fact that we've lost the passion You see, if you really love God, you're going to love his commands. You say, well, pastor, that doesn't make sense. I hate commands. Our sin nature hates commands. But if we look at God's word and we say, this is what God says I should be like and this is what I should be doing, he's telling me that because he's not trying to crimp my style. He's trying to make my life better. Don't you see it? He wants you to enjoy life. He wants you to get the most out of life. He wants you to be blessed beyond belief. But he can't pour his blessing out on us if we're failing to walk with him, if our hearts are cold, our hearts are Laodicean. And that becomes the issue for us as a follower of Jesus Christ. God still requires that Christ's followers live a life that reflects their faith. And this would be the difference When Jesus taught what he taught, people came and placed their faith in him and their lives were totally transformed. And the testimony that that became was enormous. People can't deny the power of the transformed life. And they also can't deny the fact that there's great blessing. God's people show off their peace that they have with God, especially amidst trials as they come into our lives. You have opportunities, if there's a trial in your life, to display the relationship that you have with God. You live in a world, I live in a world that is full of depravity, and the depravity becomes worse by the day. And as the depravity rises up and the wickedness rises up, Christians are going to stand out more and more and their light is going to shine brighter and brighter, don't you see? 
And that's how God intended it to be. And that's what God wants from us as followers of him. God is not a God placing undue burdens on his followers. God is a God who loves us and wants the best for us. Let's pray. As we bow our heads before the Lord this morning, let me just encourage you to know that God has sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross because he wants you to have eternal life. He wants you to be free from the slavery of sin. He wants you to enjoy the blessings. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure of your faith in Christ. For this reason, we have a couple of people up front that would love to to answer questions, help you, pray with you, whatever the need might be. And immediately following this prayer, they're going to be here. If you have questions this morning, seek them out. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you all stand with me, please, as we have a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the joy that we have in Christ Jesus, the blessings we have in Christ. Father, we thank you for the love that you have shown to us. Help us, Father, as we leave here today to remember the many blessings that you've poured out upon us and be so very thankful and passionate towards you. We thank you for all you've done in Christ's name. Amen. Just a quick word before you go. If you're visiting with us here today, don't forget to fill out the visitor's card at the welcome station in the foyer. They'll give you a gift bag. That's a pretty good deal. And so encourage you to do that. And encourage you to stay for an ABF. If you haven't gone into Adult Bible Fellowship class, uh, we have four that are meeting today. Uh, check them out. Uh, they're slightly different, all four of them, I'm sure. Um, but we welcome you to stay uh, and, and spend a little bit of time in the Word of God. Our second service is at 11. And so it's a fairly shorter period of time that we're studying together this morning. God bless you. Have a just great day. Don't forget the members meeting tonight, 630.